was the miracle just prior to his entrance into Jerusalem on Passover week. I have to believe with all my heart that this miracle really caused some excitement. Because we see it in the Bible. And what we see right after the miracle of Lazarus being risen from the grave, we see immediately after that in chapter 11 that the Pharisees sought to kill Jesus from that day forward. Wow. And so literally, they're after Jesus right now. Let's pick it up in chapter 12 in verse 1. Those of you that can stand, let's stand out of reverence for the reading of God's Word. Beginning at verse 1, chapter 12. Then Jesus, six days before Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment and spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Meaning he kept all the money, just putting it in plain, simple English. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying has she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him, what? Many of the Jews went away and what? Believed on Jesus. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, the Passover feast, when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Sion, behold, the king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause, the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh, I would that the world would go after Jesus today. I would that the world would go after Jesus every day. Oh, Lord, we need him today. And we want to thank you for the provision of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Available as a gift to mankind. That by grace through faith, we may receive this wonderful gift that God has given to each and every one who will just simply believe in Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us. We truly remember. Call to remembrance now all those things that are so meaningful in Passover week. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to look inside your bulletins, and as you look inside, you'll see 1 Corinthians 5, 7b at the very top of the insert inside your bulletin. And that's a portion of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, meaning the last sentence of the verse. And the last sentence of the verse reads, For even Christ, our what? Passover is what? Sacrificed. Sacrificed for us. Now some of you may not be familiar with what Passover is. Passover was when the people of the Jewish nation in Israel were held in captivity in Egypt in slavery. And they had been told by God that death was coming as the last and final curse to free them from slavery. But that they were supposed to mark their doors, the lintel and the doorpost, with the blood of the lamb. And this lamb that they were supposed to sacrifice was to be without blemish, without spot. And they would mark their door in such a manner as God had instructed. And death would pass them over that night. Well, truly, that happened. And ever since that time, God told them, I want you to keep this as a feast in remembrance of me all your generations. And so the Jewish people have held Passover every year, every year, every year. They have not stopped. Now we as Christians, we too regard Passover as a holy day. Why? Because simply the scripture says that Jesus Christ became our, our Passover for us. Meaning that Jesus is, yes, the Lamb of God that should take away the sin of the world. Amen. If you remember when Jesus was first identified by John, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus is that very sacrifice to end Old Covenant sacrifices. Old Testament sacrifices were the blood of bulls and goats and lambs, and that was a temporary covering for sin. Jesus' sacrifice at Calvary's cross was a one-time sacrifice for all to end all sacrifice. And Jesus paid for my sin and not for mine only, but for the sin of the what? whole world. And so everyone has forgiveness available to them. Everyone can have death pass over them. You see, the same thing that happened for the people of Israel, those wonderful believers of that day who applied the blood on the lintel and the doorpost, which took faith to say, yes, I'll trust God, and yes, I'll apply the blood. I'll apply it to my door just like he told me to. Slapped it on the lintel and slapped it on the side post, and guess what that makes? <laughs> A cross. And they were to do that, and death as it came that night passed over their homes. And this is exactly what God does for us when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When we trust Him as our Savior and as our Lord, death passes us over too. The Bible clearly states that as many as will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I will give to them eternal life, and they will never perish. The children quoted it a moment ago. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what kind of life? Everlasting life. And the very next verse says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. God brought Jesus into this world for salvation. In Matthew 26, it teaches us that Jesus went into a garden called Gethsemane. We see it later on in the Gospel of John. and We see how that he went through some very difficult moments just prior to the cross. He had several moments of prayer there. And his prayer was so intense, there was actually blood drops from his brow before the crown of thorns was placed on his head. That's intense praying. 
Jesus was about to face something that he really did not want to face. You say, what is it that he didn't want to face, Pastor? Did he not want to face the scourging, which, by the way, that whip had attached to it metal pieces that were like hooks that actually grabbed the flesh as it was struck and striped the back of Jesus. And by his stripes we are what? Healed. Healed, Isaiah the prophet said. And yes, they scourged him and then they crucified him. You say, well, is that what he was praying about when he said, let this cup pass from me? Nevertheless, Father, thy will be done. Is that what he really meant? That he wanted to avoid all that pain and all that suffering for us? You see, I believe that that's not really what he was really that concerned about. The Bible teaches me, and I believe it teaches every one of us, that Jesus was in constant connection with the Father. Amen. Constant communion. The Bible says that I always say what the Father has told me to say. I always do what the Father has told me to do. He was in constant communion with the Father for his entire life. However, the Bible teaches that there was a moment of darkness, a period of darkness, three hours from noon to 3 p.m. Very unlikely that it would go completely dark in that area from noon to 3 p.m. But it did. And after it did in Matthew 26 and other places in our Bible, in the Gospels, it teaches us, yes, Jesus said those seven great sayings from the cross. And as he completed that last saying and said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And the Bible says he gave up the spirit at that very moment. And at that very moment, the Bible says that the, the veil of the temple tore from the top to the bottom. Thus signifying that Jesus is the way to come through him now to God the Father in his presence. So he died there at that cross providing the way, the truth, and the life. As God's what? Lamb. But what was it that he wanted to avoid? Was it death itself? Was it the, the fact that he was going to be separated from his father for the very first time in his whole life? Hear me. Jesus was about to experience separation from God the Father. This had never happened to him before. And I believe with all my heart that is truly what he meant when he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. Not that one. Please don't let separation take place. But you see, it had to. Because that was when all our sin got poured out into him. That was when he bore every sin I have ever committed and will ever commit. And in those three hours, God poured out the sin of the entire world. The entire world. And for three hours, it went dark. And what were his words? Ellie, Ellie, love my son, baby. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was perfect. He was like that lamb without a blemish, without a spot. He didn't hurt anybody. He did no harm in life. He was the perfect Son of God. Without sin, regardless what they say in the world, Jesus, my Savior, went to the cross without sin. Amen. And what he did not want to face was the moments of separation that he had to face. Amen. For me, 
and for all of us. And in that moment where he cried that out, he said those other famous words, his sixth saying, it is what? Finished. Finished. It's done. You won't need to have to sacrifice a lamb again next year. It's done now. You won't need to bring any more bullets and, and doves and, and all of these heifers and the various sacrifices. You won't have to bring those any longer because God says His sacrifice is once and for all. Once and for all, it is finished. You know, when I think of Passover and what it means, it truly has carried over into Christianity. Because now Jesus has told us that every time we partake of the Lord's Supper to remember and so the Lord's Supper has become our remembrance of death passing us over. Even as the Jewish people have Passover, every year they regard it, every year they regard it without fail, every year they regard it and remember that by the blood of the Lamb, they were set free. Amen. And Jesus is saying to them when He took that cup, and he passed it around to his disciples. He said, this is my blood, which is shed for thee. Do this in remembrance of me. The Passover had now become the Lord's Supper. And we continue to do it, don't we? Amen. To remember what he did for us. To remember, to remember, to remember. And I'm so very thankful that Jesus took my place at the cross of Calvary. Amen. I want you to look now at chapter 12 at verse 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said signifying what What's that word? Death. Death. He should die. You know, a lot of people think that that has more to do with the resurrection. Actually, it has to do with him being lifted up on the cross. Signifying what death he should have. And the Bible says, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of God be lifted up. And that's a whole other story about this, the serpent in the wilderness. But let me tell you something. When we look to Jesus as our Savior, we obtain salvation. Amen. And he's saying that I am doing this for you. And it says there, the people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abided forever. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? <laughs> wow, he talks about you have the light with you now. Mm -hmm. But yet some people don't recognize him. And you know, we still have that problem today, don't we? Jesus is just as real today as He was 2,000 years ago. Say amen to that. Amen. And He is here today by His Spirit. Amen. He dwells in me. And if you have trusted in Him, He dwells in you. And the Bible says that whenever we gather together as His children, He says, there I am. I'm in the middle of all of you. And those that worship Me must worship Me in spirit and in truth. And if we're going to worship Him today, He says, you got to really come to Me first. And then it can be true worship. Jesus gives so many invitations to mankind. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So many times he invites people to come. So many times. I've had people ask me through the years, Pastor, 
Do you think it was the Romans that killed Jesus? Or do you think it was the Jews that cried out, crucify him, that killed Jesus? And I get this question all the time. And of course, the History Channel will try to put on their explanation of it. And this National Geographic will try to put on their explanation of it. And everybody will try to put on their explanation of it. But let me tell you something. Jesus said very plainly, no man taketh my life from me. I lay it down. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. Amen. And what he's just simply saying is, is I love you so much, I'm going to lay down my life for you, and then I'm going to rise again. Amen? Amen. And so this week, we remember that he did this for us. But we're also celebrating the fact that in this he provided eternal life because he defeated sin at Calvary and he defeated death at an empty tomb. Say amen to that. Amen. Amen. You see, this is what this week is all about. That Christ Jesus has fulfilled the scriptures. He has become the Passover Lamb of God and all that will come to him, death will pass them over. And they will have the gift of eternal life. And you say, well, Pastor, how in the world do you know that? Well, that's exactly what the Bible says. And if you would like to read it with me, turn with me to 1 Peter. And we'll read it right from the Bible. Right from the Word of God. That He has washed you in His precious blood and made you a fit vessel for the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of what? The blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a what? Lively hope. Lively hope. And by what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. You have a reservation waiting for you that cannot be denied. Amen? Amen. I love it. I love it. It doesn't fade away. It's not like earthly inheritances. The attorney doesn't get 40%. And probate, the government doesn't get another 40%, leaving you only 20%. <laughs> okay, it doesn't happen that way with God. You see, you get 100% with God. Amen? Amen? It doesn't fade away. You get all of what He promised. It's undefiled. And notice verse 5. A lot of people think they're holding on to their salvation. Bless God, He's holding on to us. Who are kept by what? The power of who? God. God. Through faith unto salvation. Ready to be revealed in the last time. Where ye greatly rejoice. So now for a season if need be. You're in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith be much more precious than that of gold that perishes. Though it be tried with fire. Might be found unto praise and honor and glory. At the appearing of who? Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 17 and 18 with me. We'll skip ahead. And if he call on the Father who is without respect of person, judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers, but with the, say it with me, church, precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, and without what? Spot. Now that is exactly what was required in the law when it said that the sacrificial lamb had to be without blemish and without spot. And what this text is saying to us here, elect according to the foreknowledge of God through sanctification of the Spirit and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you, Wow, that's overpowering. What he's saying to you is the believing church has been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. Amen. 
and death is going to pass you over. You have your reservation waiting for you. It's saying right there in verse 2 and 3, through sanctification of the Spirit and obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now the high priest would take the hyssop branch, he would dip it into the bowl, and he would literally sprinkle it upon the vessels of the temple and the people of the congregation, sanctifying them before God's presence. Now let me tell you something. God has sanctified us all right, but it's by the precious what? Blood of Jesus, who is without what? Blemish or spot. He that knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Amen. He became that for us when He faced those dark hours and took upon Himself all my sin on the tree. And of course, Peter goes on to explain that in chapter 2, I want you to look at verse 24. 1 Peter 2.24 Who his own self bear our sins in what? His own body. In his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness. For by his stripes ye were what? Healed. Healed. It talks about if you're going astray, let Jesus be the shepherd of your soul. Bring you in. Amen. I want to encourage you today. God has provided the way of salvation. You see, I believe that his disciples were going through the beginning of some real fear now. Because now they begin to look for Jesus. Judas has betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus will be arrested in the garden as he's identified by Judas Iscariot. And as Jesus says, I am, the guards literally fall over backwards because he's making the statement that was made in Exodus of who God is. When Moses said, who should I say sent me? And he said, tell them I am sent you. And certainly, I am is revealed in Jesus Christ. And I will remind us of the very words of Jesus just before the garden experience, just before his crucifixion. These are his comforting words to those he would leave behind and those of future generations to come. He said these words from John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, ye may be also one of his disciples, Thomas Didymus, said, Lord, we know not where thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Philip said, Lord, will you show us the Father and it will suffice us? And Jesus said, Have I been with you such a long time, Philip? And yet thou hast not known me? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. How sayest thou then? Show us the Father and it will suffice us. These were the comforting words of Jesus right before his departure. I am the way the truth and the life. Don't let your heart be troubled. I've taken care of your eternal destiny. I've taken care of your eternal life question. I've taken care of your concerns of life after death. I have provided a wonderful place for you. Someday, I'm coming back to receive you 
that where I am, you're going to be also. Wow. That's a wonderful promise. Amen. Amen. I like what Daryl said to me the other day. He said, Pastor, he says, I love it when you talk about eternal life and going on. He says, I'm just not ready for the next puzzle yet. <laughs> I love it. And you know what? None of us, I don't think, right here this morning are ready for the next bus load yet. But isn't it wonderful that we can talk that way? Amen. Isn't it wonderful that we have confidence in our Savior? Amen. And this week, we can have all the confidence. Oh, thank you, Lord, for defeating sin at Calvary. And thank you, Lord, for defeating death when you rose from the grave. Yes, give Jesus a round. All to Jesus for what he did for us. And I tell you what, if we were at a ball game and you were cheering for your home team, you'd be a lot louder than that. So let's hear it for Jesus. You know, he's our Savior, he's our Lord, and he's our coming king. And just as surely as he died for our sins and rose again the third day, he promised he would come again. And he will. And I thank him for his glorious gospel that reaches out and still brings hope to modern society to say, there is hope for your future yet. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the gift of salvation. No greater gift is available to you today than the gift of salvation. Wouldn't you like to receive Jesus today? All you have to do is say a prayer something like I said, or something like many of us said, as we received Him as Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we want to thank you for our Savior, Jesus the Christ. We want to thank you for your rich love for us, Lord Jesus, in laying down your life at Calvary's cross. We recognize that you defeated death when you rose again. We celebrate that next Sunday. But today, Lord, if there's anyone here today who's never trusted the work of the cross and the empty grave, I pray that they would do so today to say, Lord Jesus, the best I know how, I want to say I believe in you. I trust in you as my Savior. There's no other way for me to obtain salvation other than through you. Lord Jesus, save me this day. And if you've already said something like that in your life, calling upon the Lord Jesus for your salvation, perhaps you just want to say a little prayer about abiding in Him today. And just say, Lord Jesus, teach me to abide in You every day. Teach me Your way. Lead me by Your Holy Spirit and fill me with Your Holy Spirit. May you guide our life. And may you give us understanding and wisdom. Lord Jesus, I look to you. Not only as my Savior, my Lord and my coming King. We love you, Lord. And we pray all these prayers in your blessed and holy name. That name which is above every name. The name of Jesus. Amen. 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 And as we're singing, I encourage you to come forward, whether it's for your transfer of membership, your